Thank you for uh, the introduction and thank you all for coming. I say let's just get right into it. Data. Data and algorithms, they are everywhere. Like it or not, these algorithms are ranking you all the time. So essentially, we here, we are just rows in some databases. And these algorithms are sorting these rows and they are dividing these rows into the winners and losers. It sounds nasty, I know, but winners will get better conditions and losers will usually pay more or just get rejected. That's how it is. I'll give you an example. In Germany, US, and many other countries, there is something like a credit score, like credit rating. And uh, a friend of mine, also a Python developer and a very good entrepreneur, uh, he once sold his company and decided to start a new one in Berlin. So I met him a few months later in Berlin and he was still living in a temporary flat on the Airbnb. So I asked, hey, nothing meets your high class standards anymore or what? And he said, well, it's just another way around. Nobody would rent me a flat. Well, that is surprising, but the reason is, one, he didn't have the permanent fixed contract. Two, his new company was not reliable enough. And three, his credit score was just nothing impressive. So the system ranked him as a loser and he couldn't get a flat. How ridiculous is that? Another example. Think you buy a new car, like a powerful one, finally. And then you have to pay for the insurance more right away without ever doing anything because the system will categorize you as a loser that cannot drive. You will most likely have an accident, you pay more. Even if you never had an accident, you will still have to pay more. Well, if you buy the tiny car, then it's okay until you have an accident. If you ever have one, and unfortunately, another guy I know had one, he hit a bicycle. It was nothing serious, just a little crash, but still, he had to pay a lot of cash to the bicycle driver because he decided to just settle everything down himself. I asked, isn't that the case when exactly the insurance should cover you? And then he tell like, theoretically, on another hand, if I tell the insurance, they will rise my monthly payments so much that it wouldn't make any sense to me. Well, that is a win-win for the insurance business, isn't it? Like, you never have to pay, awesome. It's not so good for us. Well, unfortunately, it gets worse. Imagine a situation when you apply uh, for account in some bank. You always have to fill out some forms and one of the questions in that form is your nationality. And answering wrong to that one single question can get you rejected. You will be categorized as a not trustworthy person. You will not be trusted. They will just throw away your application just because of that. Well, this is not just a bad algorithm now. It's a discrimination in its purest form. But they're just justifying it by the big data analysis. They say the system cannot lie. You cannot really sue the system. But, but we have nothing to do with it. Well, obviously it does. Even though the system, they say the system is not biased, but the developers may be. And obviously the developer who did it was not the most professional one. So we can get into more examples, of course, like think of a, a crime prediction systems. Like they can say how much of a criminal are you without you ever doing a crime. It gets worse. But my question is more like, how come? How come we live in this modern progressive society? We have our privacy laws. We have these awesome nerdy get togethers with code of conduct, with respect, with everything. How come we still have to deal with this mess on a daily basis and it all happens somehow behind us? And the main thing, whose fault it is? And unfortunately, I believe it's ours. Because there is a data scientist behind every algorithm, behind every system that is analyzing our data. And it is not some politician who could come and fix this. It's us who should take it more serious and do the data analysis right. So let's just have a fresh start now, fresh start. <laughs> and let's imagine how would we do the data analysis the right way? How can we master it so that nobody can misuse it? Basically, imagine we have a perfect conditions for everything and let's just do it step by step. So we are awesome developers and we want to do things right. What do we need for the data analysis? Well, we obviously need the data first. Then we need tools to analyze the data, second. And then finally we need to visualize it, analyze it, and make some conclusions out of it. Good. Let's start with the data. 
Anyone remember the famous five exabyte quote that press loves so much about that we are creating daily five exabytes of data that is equal to our entire history until 2003? Well, I am tired of this quote, to be honest. Anyone else tired of this? No, but conference speakers do like it. Uh, I'm tired of it, and I decided to check it. So this famous statement of Eric Schmidt is most likely based on the IDC report that was done like 10 years ago, more or less. And they indeed say that uh, every two days back then we created five exabytes of data. And they also said that this is the same amount of data that was collected by 2003. The only difference with this statement is that here it says we did up to 2003. So we imagine it like since the beginning of the history. While in fact the report says more like since we started collecting the data. And guess when they started collecting the data? 2002. So one year before this. So here we already have our first learning into the path of mastering the big data. Check your data. Don't blindly believe to the things. Like even, okay, it's Eric Schmidt. Probably he just somehow misinterpreted it. I don't consider this as a lie. But anyway, even the quote that is copy pasted so much that is used in dozens of TED talks and stuff, even it can be not entirely true, let's say this way. But that being said, this quote, it still shows the situation, right? So we indeed produce enormous amounts of data today. But I want you to think about what is the data and what is information? What do we have in these five exabytes? So if you think of the five exabytes of the ancient data that in the old times, then you probably imagine something like this. It's a difficult writing process. The storage is expensive as hell. And people only write down like essential facts about the history, some lifetime discoveries and stuff. If you think of the five exabytes that we produce daily now, to me it looks more like this. <laughs> Please don't get me wrong. Cats totally deserve all the space on the internet they need. That's the base of today's internet. I give credit for that. On the other hand, uh, yeah, if in the ancient times one person could probably read, well, one genius person could probably read like all of the knowledge in the world and understand most of it, now even a machine cannot parse through our daily five exabytes. And here they need us, data scientists. So we need to take this five daily exabytes and squeeze maybe a few bytes of the useful data out of it. That's our first job to do. Obviously, not so easy. We need tools for that. And I would like to ask, who of you are data scientists? OK, so we have some. Then maybe we can have a little guess. So what do you think is the most popular tool worldwide that data scientists use, not limited to Python? Very good, very smart. OK, so it is indeed Excel. As you see over there, this is the survey that O'Reilly does uh, every year. They ask about the tools, salaries, everything, the tasks. And we can see that, yeah, Excel indeed wins here, but Python is a number four. And as you see, we are way forward than the number five. So these are good news. And this news basically says that we, Python developers, we can have impact in this world. Then. Um, Another thing, like why Python, why Python is on the position number four, is quite obvious. Like Python is a language literally for everyone. Would you be a beginner or would you be a super nerdy data scientist? You you'll find your thing in Python. And also important thing is that in Python we have the community that ensures the growth and support in Python libraries. This is essential in open source. And I believe that this is uh, maybe the most important reason why we are there now and the number four above all of the corporations. If you'd like to know more about the role of Python in the data science, I highly recommend you to watch the talk of Travis Oliphant on the EuroPython 14, uh, this guy. So he's the founder of the Anaconda and Continuous Analytics, also the creator of NumPy, I believe, and other scientific tools, so he knows how it works. I'll not speak now about it, but uh, just a little, a little quote that he did is that like, 20 years ago, more or less, they were thinking with others, with other fellows, like, uh, hey, 
we could probably do all of the calculations. We, we could set all of our data science environments in Python. Like, it's a bit risky, but on another hand, why don't we use Python as a replacement for the high-level languages like MATLAB, the languages we love so much? And here we are today, above MATLAB, above Java and friends. This is a proof that it indeed works, and uh, we can change the world, basically. Then another tool that we obviously need is math. And this is an interesting thing because, uh, as you said, I run an agency and some of the clients, they say like, hey, do the data analysis for us because there is a lot of math and we hate math. It's like not, not our thing. And they probably think of math as of something like this. That's a good business for us, but to be honest, math is more like this in most of the cases. Like you need to sum things up, divide, find means, and that's it for the introductory analysis, right? Well, of course you can say, you guys are just lame, you take the lame jobs. Then I'll show you the statistics again. And it says, uh, the same Aureli research, it says that the most used, uh, the most uh, like uh, oftenly uh, done task is a basic exploratory data analysis. Also far above others. And for that, you do not need crazy math. You do need a lot of math, but it's more like a high school math, not the crazy math. That's how it works. Now, we could speak about the tools much longer because there are so many of them in Python, but each deserves probably a separate talk. So I would just jump now to the analyzing the data, and, uh, to making conclusions out of the data and finding patterns in it. So this is often the overlooked part. Thing is that because of the way that our brains, our human brain are uh, processing the information, we can recognize the patterns in the visual data much faster than we would do in a table of numbers. But just asking like, hey, what's out there, makes us lost. The right question should be, what do I wish I could find there? And then we can do the right visualization for it. But let's just make an experiment. Everyone remembers the uh, patent wars on the smartphone businesses. Uh, Apple, Google, Oracle, that stuff. So there is even a very nice Wikipedia article about that. Here is uh, Wikipedia at its best. Information is very well structured, it's sorted by years, we have just essential facts about things that happened in that year. And uh, we can see here unbiased facts like Apple use Nokia, Nokia use Apple, stuff like that. Okay. Now, as we are already looking on this picture for quite some time, um, can anyone find out what is the company that sued Apple and Apple didn't sue this company back out of this? I dub we can't because that's not the way our brains work. We do not like to find information in just text. Texts are more like stories. Uh, visual data works much better for us. So at this point, I'll just show you a little example. Obviously, I will use IPython because it's a default tool everyone is using. And here I'm using the BQ plot uh, library. That's something that uh, Bloomberg has recently released. If you didn't use it yet, use it. It's awesome. So I'll just make it quick by running everything. Run all below. Didn't work. Uh, run all. Did work. So now it's visualized. And let's take Apple, drag it in the middle. And now I bet you can very easily find which arrow goes to Apple and Apple does not hit back. It's Kodak here. Uh, that's just a statistic for one year. Be sure Apple did see you back. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it shows us the point. It shows us a point that visualizations make it easier for people to recognize pattern and to find uh, the exceptions while interpreting the data at much higher pace, as if, do, if, as if we would do by just reading a table or text. And translating complicated data into a simple big picture concept is essential when we're dealing with big data volumes. Now, that was just a little Wikipedia article. Let's take another example that is also quite loved on the internet, this book, Les Miserables. It's popular because someone has sparsed the metadata out of it, so it's actually in many examples out there on the internet. So this popular novel, uh, imagine we never read it, and we want to find the interactions of the characters in this book without reading this book. Someone parsed out this, big thanks for that. This is just basically a matrix of one character, next character, amount of dialogues they have. And of course, we're going to use 
again, IPython. But now with Bokeh. Okay, let's make it quick again. Run all. Bokeh loaded. All right, so uh, I'm not going through through the lines here because I get, I, I bet half of you knows it already anyway, and another half can just look up the documentation, which will be faster. But anyway, this is the output. We are just plotting names here and here, and the amount of interaction, and the more uh, saturated color is it, uh, the more uh, interactions we have in the book. And we can already see the patterns very clear. We see that this is some group of people, this is some group of people, this is some group of people, and my favorite is up here, child one and child two. Another mini group. <laughs> I never read it, but I already know it, so it indeed helps us to process the data at a faster pace. All right, let's jump, jump back. Yeah, so in this example, we took a big story and converted it into a data matrix, essentially. But this is boring. Can we do the opposite? Can we take the boring data and convert it into the story? Yes, we can. Uh, a writer, Henry Green, once said, the more you leave out, the more you highlight what you leave in. And he probably didn't think of it back then, but it perfectly applies to data science. So the more, when, when we do the visualizations, we are encouraged to pick the most interesting insights out of the data and leave out everything irrelevant. And the man who probably does it the best here is Hans Rosling. Uh, he is a Swedish data scientist who makes awesome visualizations of the charts. Basically, he took a picture of uh, global development built from the statistics out of economics and healthcare, and he built some just awesome things. You, you can just look up his, uh, his talks on the internet, it's great. Of course, we cannot do it because we are not hands roll things, but we can try to copy it, at least a little subset of it, having Python. Here, we'll be doing the example of his visualization of the wealth of nations. Who knows wealth of nations? Some people do. Okay, it's a really famous thing, you should really watch it. Oh, this is confusing me. Okay, here. Wealth of nations. So uh, just a little introduction, what he did there is, uh, it's just one of numerous examples that he did, is he took the statistics for like hundreds of years about every country, well, every country that existed, obviously. Uh, he took the statistics of their income and of their expected uh, life length and the size of the country, and he plotted it. And now we will just run all of the cells again. This is using, again, the, uh, the BQplot, I think, library. Okay, so here it is. Uh, on this axis is the income per capita of the countries. These are the countries. The bigger the dot, the bigger the country. And this is the expected uh, lifetime, like zero, uh, 10 to 90 years. And you see here everything is really low. Oops, everything is... Hold on. Everything is in the bottom around 30 years because it's the data of uh, more than uh, 100 years ago. But now if we hit play, we will see how the countries increase their income and increase their life uh, of their people. And this is actually quite fun to observe, not in a rush like we do right now, but when you really focus on one country and you take a look what was happening to it during the last 100 years, it's really exciting. Every dot on this chart is telling you a story. Of course, it was my duty to find Slovakia here. I believe it's somewhere here. Yeah, Slovak Republic. So uh, this is quite a, quite a straightforward way the Slovakia did, I think. So they didn't live long and they didn't have much of the money, but then they started to have money and started to live longer. So that's kind of a standard case. There is no big sense. It's like, they do it right. Let's see more extreme examples, uh, like, for instance, uh, here, uh, Saudi Arabia. They didn't live long, they had a lot of cash, they took all of the minerals they had, and then they started to invest into health. And then they had less money, but their life started to get longer. So this is an example of a good policy. And then if you really go through these dots over here, you can see countries that do the opposite. 
when the health was good, oh, for example, China. China, they just, they just, yeah, well, this is not a lecture about the history, but just play with it. This is just an example that tells you that just taking boring stats and visualizing it right can tell you a whole story. Now let's just jump back. Okay. So the data informs our choices and it impacts our lives more than we re realize. Therefore, it makes it necessary for us to accurately understand it and to process our data the right way to master our data. And data visualization, as I showed, it shouldn't be considered like another gimmicky marketing tool that you just show to your customers. Instead, it's a fundamental way that industries should go towards, go, go, go forwards. And often this is not valid that, that, that much. Often we think that it's just a little thing that we can use in advertising, but essentially it is something that can indeed have an impact on this world. And if this was not enough impact for you, how much time do we have? Dear moderator. Just keep going. I think we can just keep the break. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. I don't want to take the break. Yeah, well, if you think that, okay, that was a nice history, but it's history. How about the present and the future? Uh, I'll just show you uh, another example. If you can read this word, you are already very good. You are probably a scientist. Uh, I took my time to read it. Uh, but what they say themselves, the scientists, they say scanning brains. So this is another example of uh, now brain scanning business that they do. And you can imagine it has a lot of information going out of there, a lot of data that you need to analyze somehow. And of course, since it's in my presentation, of course you can use Python. Example number four. Okay, let's go through it. So uh, here it's, uh, uh, we use again the library, the BQplot, but this is not a requirement because even before BQplot, it was just released two years ago, I think they still used Python and classical tools like matplotlib with it. Uh, the important thing here is a, uh, is a m and &E library that was developed by the medical scientists that is written in Python, saying that it's a good choice for tasks like this. And this is a huge data set that I downloaded it, so it takes some time to process it. Now we're just preparing the charts, and okay, so this is a brain map, or more precisely, the map of the sensors that they put next to our brains. And then they want to see uh, what activity is uh, taking place at these dots. So for this, we need to execute this function here. And here we go. So now we have the plot of uh, signals that are going through our brains. And if you look at just on this chart alone, even though signals in different, in different parts of your brains are color coded, so they have different colors, this is probably not enough. Even though it's visualized, it's not enough to understand what's happening out there in your head. So for this, they need a second chart, uh, the map of your brain. And then only two in combinations would give some results that you can actually understand. Like here you can scroll through this, and unfortunately here we can see it good, but anyway, uh, it shows what exactly happens where at which part of your brain when they're showing you particular pictures here and here. So they can see the parts of the brain responsible for reactions to particular images. In this case, they were showing faces. So this has quite, quite some impact on the industry. And then there is another library written in JavaScript that was ported here in IPython to to be embeddable. That is basically the same thing, but it's visualizing uh, the head in 3D. So we can take a more complicated shape here and do the same thing. We can just scroll through the signals and see what's happening where at which point of time as the reaction to which events. And that's basically what they do. They take pictures, they show it to humans and animals, and they see what, uh, how our brains react. And this is the key to curing many brain diseases, in fact. So this is the present and it is the future and it is Python used to bring this future. All right, we had it. So now as, uh, I think there is no point of showing you more examples like this. Uh, I just have one last little thing that is often left out of uh, the process of mastering big data. Like imagine now the stuff that we discussed, would it be now enough to uh, build our perfect data processing pipeline. Would all of the tools that we have now at our disposal be enough to fix this situation that 
not very nice situations that I described to you at the beginning of this talk. Uh, probably not, not without the help of one little tiny thing that is left out. So think of it like without the help of the artificial intelligence, the machine learning, and all of the data science technologies that we have at our, uh, at our hands right now, we would probably be not able to do this big data revolution that is happening right now. No way we could do it, that's right. Yet still, uh, the most important element that is driving the insights out of the data is something that uh, we have and the machines don't. It's a human factor. So we all have, for instance, access to Google. But it is our curiosity that defines what are we searching for, what are we learning, and uh, what do we consider as relevant, and what do we filter out. Then, uh, then comes the empathy, next to the curiosity. The empathy is a key to connect with others, to understand the needs of other people, to find a spot, this little spot where we can make our impact. And then comes the imagination. Imagination helps us to see the things that are not there yet, to visualize things that do not exist, and so to find the, pieces of, uh, the, the missing pieces of the puzzle. And then comes creativity. Creativity helps us to solve our problems, to find the approach to solving them. And then comes communication. We solved our problems, now we need to communicate the result with the world. So we need to spread our ideas, the ideas that bring change to others. And then finally, here comes the leadership. The leadership is a human thing that lets us to step up, gather these awesome like-minded people, and finally fix our broken world. That's it, thank you. Wow, just wow, wasn't this yeah. amazing? <laughs> Obviously, I have to credit, it's not enough probably, because uh, you can understand I'm not a neuroscientist, a historian, and so on, so I took examples from other sources. Uh, please, I highly recommend you to go through it. I hope the slides will be published somewhere, because each of these examples that I showed you deserves a separate talk on its own. This is one of the amazing things I love so much about the Python community, that a lot of, a lot of us in this room are doing a lot of different things at once. I have interest in all kinds of areas, and, um, and it's fascinating to see, see, uh, see them combined this way. There's just one question for you. Yes. You absolutely captivated the audience. I was, I was watching Slido, and there was nothing coming, so everybody was paying attention, all eyes on you. And the one question, you, you partially answered, you said the, the slides would be available. Will, will the Jupyter Notebooks also be available after the talk? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, in fact, uh, like if you go on the examples of the BQ Pilot libraries that I was advertising, or Bokeh, uh, there, are examples, uh, there are some examples that I showed, and there are even more, much more, because I couldn't keep your attention for like 30 minutes going fast through many of them. There are, in fact, much more of examples also about the neuroscience, about the statistics, uh, Hans Rosling stocks. So they are available online. I'll just send you the links to the libraries. I guess. I'll publish them I mean, in my slides, the links to the libraries. And you can find much more of uh, awesome examples of the data science done in Python. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. Thank you.